my name is Mr. Apauri and I will be your history facilitator A level. Today we want to look at the French Revolution, starting with the causes of the revolution. Our objectives for this lesson will be to be able to define the term revolution, to be able to list the causes of the revolution, and to assess the contributions of each of the causes we will list towards the outbreak of the revolution. Learners should also be able to organize these causes into short term and long term, as well as being able to classify the causes into political, social, and economic causes. Let's start by defining the term revolution. What is a revolution? A revolution refers to fundamental changes that may take place within a society. These changes may be political, may be economic, or may be social. Two things are always obvious in a revolutionary environment. The first thing is that the old the old order within, or the old elements within this particular society that is experiencing a revolution are changed. They are displaced. And the second thing is that the new, new elements are introduced into this particular society. So when we look at revolution, we get the idea that a revolution always brings about a change. A revolution may be a gradual process, or it might be just sudden. Right. Now let's go through the causes of the French Revolution. Let's remember this revolution broke out in 1789. 1789. Right. The first cause of the revolution was the system of the ancient regime. By ancient regime, we are talking about the old system of governance. The old system of governance. This system became burdensome to the people of France. To a point that by 1789, they wanted this system to be thrown away. They wanted this system to be changed. The system of the ancient regime, or the old system of governance, was characterized by such elements like absolutism. This is where we see the king having all the power in his hands. Louis the 15th, the grandfather to Louis the 16th, who was the king by 1789, is quoted to have said, I am the state. Meaning to say, there was nothing above the king. There was no power above that of the king. To a point that the king could do anything that he wanted without any limitations. Louis XVI himself is said to have said, is quoted to have said, the thing is legal because I wish it so. Meaning the king's will becomes the law. This is absolutism, where all power is concentrated in the hands of one man. This was mainly caused because there was lack of constitutionalism. There was no constitution to guide the operations of the government. Ancient regime was also characterized by the principle of divine authority or divine rule of kings. This is whereby the king says, oh, I am answerable only to God and no man can question me or tell me what to do or how to govern. This system had three pillars. The three pillars of the ancient regime were the monarchy, were the church, 
and the aristocracy. The moment we mention the aristocracy, already we can tell that such a society under an ancient system of governance is divided into classes, into social classes, what we call social stratification. And as we may tell, the French society was divided into three main classes. There was the clergy, which was the first estate, the second estate of the nobility, and the third estate of the peasants, the commoners. And such a system is characterized by an environment whereby those who are in power, those who have political and economic muscles, use them to oppress those at the bottom. And by 1789, such a system had become so toxic, so burdensome to an extent that the people at the bottom now wanted to dislodge this system and bring about a new system of governance. Secondly, France was experiencing economic crisis. There was serious economic, there were serious economic problems in France by 1789. However, it is very important, learners, for us to note that the economic crisis did not start during the reign of Louis XVI. Louis inherited an already fragile economic system from his grandfather, who had also inherited the same. So economic crisis had started as long back as the period of Louis XIV. However, it got worse during the period of Louis XVI, therefore leading to the outbreak of the revolution. Feudalism. This is a system of ownership of the means of production. Feudalism in France was so bad as to a point that it is said that once a person was born a peasant, they would die a peasant. And once a person was born a landlord, high chances they would die a landlord. Let's take a short break, learners. We will continue with our lesson. continuing with our look at the causes of the French Revolution. The next cause was the system of privileges. As we have already noted, the French society was divided into social classes. And the top classes, the first and the second estates in the French society, had so many privileges. Whereas the bottom class, the third estate, had no access to privileges. Some of the privileges include access to land, they were exempted from payment of taxes, and they were the ones for whom top positions in the church and in the government were reserved. Appointment to positions was not open to ability, but rather people got top positions on grounds of birthright. There was the church, influence of the church, another cause. The French church at this point was the Roman Catholic church. This church was so powerful that it is said that it was the most powerful institution in France. It owned vast pieces of land which were underutilized. This church was the only church that was allowed in France. So it means there was no freedom of worship. Every Frenchman was born a Catholic. And they were forced, by the way, to pay tithes, whether you go to church or you don't. Some, everyone was supposed to pay tithes. The church has had the power to control education. 
The same church was responsible for the registration of births, for the registration of deaths, and for the registration of all marriages. So this was a very powerful institution. And it is imperative for us to know that the same church was so influential in the politics such that the king could not make any decision without consulting with the church leaders, including the Pope himself. He was very influential in French politics. The next cause, the character and the weaknesses of the king, the King Louis XVI. Louis was so weak, one historian has said that he was very fat and very dull. Louis was so inconsistent in decision making that the next person he would meet after having made a decision could easily change his mind. He was so much under the influence of the aristocracy that he could not make any decision by himself and he could not stand by his decisions. Peacock says he would cry when he talked about the suffering of his people, meaning that he knew that the people were suffering, but he had no ability to enforce changes. He had no ability to enforce any policy that was not in the favor of the aristocrats and the clergy. He was a very weak king. He appointed controller generals, some of whom proposed very fundamental changes which could attend the situation for the good. But whenever he faced criticism, whenever he was given pressure from the top to change, he easily dismissed them. He could not support his controller general. Then there was the influence of the queen. This woman is very interesting. You know, it has been said that Louis was married to a chicken-minded woman. It's said that uh, one historian has said she was very beautiful, but this historian said what she led in intelligence, she made up in beauty. Her mother is said to have claimed that she had never learned anything more than just writing her name. She was not educated. She was not a woman who was supposed to be put in a position of such influence to give advice to a king, especially at a time when, Christ, when France was in deep crisis. Mary was so extravagant. Mary Antoinette, the queen. So extravagant. She tops the list of the most extravagant woman, women in the history of the world up to this day. She said, she said to have declared that she could not do with less than 300 servants in a palace. She could not do with less than six new pairs of shoes every week. And these things that she, she wanted, she would go overseas for shopping. She would go to the Americas, she would go to other countries for shopping, to Britain and so forth, for shopping. At a time when the country was in deep financial crisis. So this, this influence, Mary is also said to have been exercising so much influence over the king such that she was the one who almost made all decisions. His officials are said to have complained that the king is never present for us. And every, the, the queen is the one who is everywhere about the king. He's always in the bedroom with the, with the queen. He's under Pitcourt government. This is how the situation was like between these two characters, the king and his queen. So one can really see that such people were not suitable for dealing, for were not suitable to deal with the problems France was facing by 1789. The other factor, external influence. France 
by 1789 was in such chaos that people became politicians. You know, when a society is under instability, people become so much interested in politics. So by 1789, people started to compare the politics, the economic situation of their countries to those of other countries. And the country that told the list was India. By 1789, most people were comparing the politics of their country, were comparing the economy of their country to that of England. And they always saw that England was better. And they started craving for a system that was similar to that of England. Let's have an English political system in our country such that things may become better. Let us have as an economic system that is similar to that of England, such that things may become better. Let us stay tuned. We will continue from this point after the break. Before the break, we were talking about the influence of other countries on France. So for England, we say the people of France wanted a similar system to that of England. <clears throat> Besides that, in 1786, Louis XVI signed a trade agreement with the Britain a trade agreement which allowed cheap British goods to flood the French markets. And this trade agreement destroyed the French industry because French products could not compete with the English products which were flooding the French market. And the West, this wasn't the economic system which was already fragile. The other country that had so much influence on the French by 1789 was USA, United States of America. Firstly, there was the American War of Independence in which France took part. This war drained the fiscus of France. This war also benefited nothing to the French, having borrowed a lot of money to go there and fight in that war. At the end of it all, they benefited nothing. All they suffered were losses, and the people of France started to question the worthiness of taking part in this war. Secondly, the soldiers who went to America came back with a revolutionary mind. They started to question. The, they realized that the same system that they had went to fight, that they had gone to fight in America, was the very same system they were exposed to back at home. So when they came back, they came back with the revolutionary ideas where they wanted to fight and change their own system. The other cause, the influence of philosophers. There are a number of philosophers who played an important role. But Lenas, it is very imperative, very important for us to note that none of our philosophers, none of them advocated for a revolution. All that the philosophers did was to bring ideas of enlightenment. They just opened the minds of the people for people to see and to get better understanding of how things were supposed to be. The most influential of our philosophers were Voltaire. Voltaire advocated for a constitution. Let's have a constitution, constitutionalism, in order to limit absolutism, in order to limit the powers of the king. He also advocated for freedom of worship such that the power of the Catholic Church could be reduced and its influence from politics could also be, be removed. There is Montesquieu. 
Montesquieu advocated for a system of separation of powers. Montesquieu said, we can't have all power in the hands of one man. Let there be three arms of government. This should be executive, judiciary, and legislature. A government should have these three arms. The executive is made up of the king himself and his ministers, the cabinet. The judiciary, this has to deal with the law. They deal with the law, the courts of law. Then the legislature, these, this is what we call the parliament in our, in, in our country. These are responsible for making laws. Instead of having one person doing all this, let there be separation of powers. Then we also have Rosso. Rosso advocated for a social contract. Rosso was saying the people must be involved in the process of governance of their own country. How do they get involved? The people should be given the power to choose whom they want to govern them. And the same people should also be given the right to remove these people from power if they fail to do what they want. However, they should remove them not violently but peacefully through elections. This is what Rosso is saying. So these were the most influential philosophers who contributed to the outbreak of the revolution by enlightening the people, opening up the minds of the people. Finally, we've got natural disasters. I don't know why it is always that when the situation is not so right, natural disasters always come. In, during the 1788-89 rain season, France experienced a serious drought. A serious drought. Drought. Then this drought was followed in 1789 by a heavy winter, a heavy winter, a very heavy winter, such that the roads were blocked. And this made it very difficult for the government to even attempt to distribute food to those areas in France that had been affected by the serious drought. Actually, some historians even say the government never tried to help the people deal with the effects of the drought. So this led to so many people from the rural areas and from the most affected regions to start flooding Paris, which happened to be the capital city, to try and look for better opportunities, hoping to get better opportunities. You know, people always think that life in the cities is better than in the rural areas or other smaller towns. So people started flooding Paris, only to find the situation in Paris more difficult. There were no jobs, life was very expensive. This caused people to become revolutionary because life was tough. Besides, these natural disasters also worsened the already fragile economic system. Jobs were no longer there, industries were closing because there were no raw materials, cost of living was very high because of scarcity of products. Learners, as we wrap up, these are the causes of the French Revolution. Let's be able to explain how each and every one of these causes contributed towards the final outbreak of the revolution in 1789. Thank you very much. We will meet in the next lesson.